where we read the Lord speaking and saying, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great, like the weeping of Hadad Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi, and their wives, the clan of Shimei, and their wives, and all the rest of the clans, and their wives. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Amen. When we lived in our first home, I decided that a loft conversion was in order. And uh, one of the jobs that was done while the loft was being converted wasn't supposed to be done. And that job was me accidentally putting my foot through the ceiling. But it was okay, because if you put your foot through the ceiling, there's a wonderful thing called Artex, which you can paint over. And it's all gravelly-like, and you can get all sorts of um, stubbly effects on it, and it hides all manner of mistakes. And indeed, if you were to uh, follow where I've lived over the years, you would follow a trail of Artex. Our first home that had it in, pretty much everywhere, we were trying to sell it, and a man came, the first couple that came to look at our house, and he took one look at the ceiling and he said, I hate Artex. Needless to say, his uh, bid never came. He didn't buy the house. People sometimes think that sin is just making mistakes. Making mistakes that you can, you can put right, or that you can hide those mistakes those things that you've done wrong. But the day of judgment, well in fact the day of judgment will reveal many people with Artex, so to speak, Artex, all over their lives, looking to cover up those mistakes. But I would say that God hates Artex. He hates people seeking to cover their sin as much as he hates sin. What he would have is people to confess their sin, not to hide it with Artex. When we consider what sin is, it's not about making mistakes. All sin ultimately comes down to one root, and that is the rejection of God. Man rejecting God. I will go my way, I will be king look at the first temptation you'll be like God hey you'll be like God isn't that wonderful you'll be like God that was the first temptation a rejection of God going your own way I'll be king I'll be number one think of a man who has a business and he takes someone on and he's very kind to them and says I'm going to make you a junior partner But behind his back, the junior partner starts pilfering the money and takes, well, all the takings, all the profits from the company. And the owner finds out about it. And he says, look, we need to talk about this before we go any further. But the man says no and flees, and flees of all this money. But the owner finally tracks him down. Maybe it's some years later, he tracks him down and finds him, perhaps it's in somewhere like Spain, I don't know. But he tracks him down. And the man who's taken the money is now sorry. 
and says, oh, can we talk about it now? But the owner of the business says, that time has gone. The time for talking is gone. Indeed, I'm going to open the door now and the police are at the door to take you away. The day of, repent- the day of judgment, repentance then, will be too late. The whole world will seek to repent on the day of judgment. But it will be too late. And it will be to their eternal regret. The Lord effectively will say to them, You went away from me. You ignored my calls to you. That you would come back to me. I extended loving arms to you. You went away. You ignored me. You went away. Therefore keep going. Keep going forever and ever and ever. Away from me. And then the weeping. Will be mighty great. But then there are others who seek to escape the day of judgment. They read or they hear about the day of judgment. They read or they hear about a just and holy God. And how God is angry with sin. They hear these things. And they use the artex of repentance. Indeed they spread it all over their lives. But what it amounts to is a false repentance. Just a covering over of the cracks. On the day of judgment, there will be no budget remedy. None whatsoever. It is only godly sorrow that brings true repentance. Only godly sorrow brings true repentance. In verse 10 of our reading, Zechariah 12, we read... And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. I put to you this morning that through this passage in Zechariah, and especially that verse that we've just read there, we see what godly sorrow truly is. And that leads me to ask then the question, when we look at that, to then ask the question, have I, have you truly repented? Or have you simply covered your soul in our text? The first thing to look at this morning is, where are they looking? The people in the verse, where are they looking? Spoke earlier about taking toys. Put it in another context now. There's two children, and it's the younger child perhaps, but he takes the older child's toy. Snatches it off of him, I want it, give me And he won't give it back. And the parent gets involved and says, now give that back to your brother or your sister. No! I want it! I want it! And all the child can see is that what they've stolen is now about to be taken back off of them. What they wanted is going to be gone. And they won't have it anymore. And so they scream and they cry and they kick. And they're sorry that it's been taken away from them again. But their sorrow is only a sorrow for their loss. That is a worldly sorrow. That is what the Bible calls worldly sorrow. It has self at the centre. It has me at the centre. I want this. And I'm sorry when I lose this. Likewise, likewise, false repentance. Now considering what repentance is, or rather is not, false repentance comes before the Lord, looks at what it has to give up. Its trail of 
sin. It's a trail of worldly delights and things that are actually detrimental to its soul. But it loves them. But they're wrong. They're condemned by God's word. Oftentimes they're condemned not because they're wronging and of themselves, but because they're first in my life. I must have these before all else. False repentance looks at what it has to give up. And just like a criminal who's been caught for one crime, but has managed to stash away all the other things, he'll face the judge for that one crime, but he ain't going to tell him about the others. He still wants all that. And he hopes that by this crime that he's been caught for, caught with, he'll only get a short sentence and then he can come and enjoy all these other things, which is the real booty. He still wants it. And so the person with false repentance comes before the Lord and they'll turn from this, because repentance is turning away from and turning to, they'll turn from this, but not that. Because that's their delight. Indeed, it's their delight above the Lord. Let me ask you, have you repented in your heart of certain things before the Lord, but there are still things that you're clinging to, even though the Word of God condemns them, or even though they may be legitimate in and of themselves, but you're putting them in the place of Almighty God? How's that true repentance? That's a halfway house. That's an artex on your life. Jesus, for many people who operate a kind of false repentance, an artex on their life, Jesus is merely a bit part. They'll keep these things. They'll keep those ways. They'll say sorry for that, what they've done, but not for this. They'll keep to that path. And Jesus is there, he's a bit part. Doesn't he save us from our sins? Well therefore I'll have him on my terms. And a shallow sorrow before God, a shallow sorrow for what we have done wrong, is, or rather leads to, a shallow repentance. We read in verse 10, They will look on me. I said at the start, where are they looking? Not at their loss. Look at verse 10. You have to find it because it's a big long verse. But they will look on me. That's where they're looking. They have a single focus. They can't stop looking. They will look on me. And if you want proof that that's Jesus Christ that they're looking on, You have to turn to John 19, don't you? And you see Jesus, the one who has been pierced. And there you see in verse 37 of John 19, as another scripture says, they will look on me, the one they have pierced. It's Christ. It's Christ they're looking on. And they can't stop looking. Such a one who is looking in that way doesn't care about anything else. They're only looking at him. The true penitent looks at him and says, Search me, O God. Forgive all. Take all. Only let me look on him. Let me look on him. Where are they looking? They're not looking at their loss. They're not looking either at their judge. When I was a schoolboy and very rebellious at that, I had an incident where I felt that I'd been wronged by a teacher. So I swore at the teacher as I stormed out. And I was so angry in my pathetic ways that all the way down the corridor, right through the length of the school, I was swearing and cursing and saying what I thought of that teacher, what I thought of that school, what I thought of all teachers, what I thought of education. And I stormed out the whole school and marched off up the road thinking, what a great person I am. How much people must think, wow, isn't he, wow, isn't he someone? The next day when I was in school, suddenly, a teacher, who I didn't really know before, 
relatively new to the school, but someone who had the look of a, well, a bit like Heinrich Himmler. If you know who Heinrich Himmler was. He had this kind of fierce look with round spectacles. And he said, Daniel Hawkes, come into my office. I came into his office and I found myself trembling in fear. Trembling. Now I was scared. Now I was sorry. Because there was no escape. No escape from this fearsome looking teacher. I said sorry to him. I said I won't do it again to him. I said whatever I felt felt he wanted to hear. Just so I could get away from him. But it was a false repentance. It was a false repentance. It was only me saying sorry because of fear of this teacher. Not because of what I'd done. Not because I was churned within and and smitten within over what I'd done. And a false repentance before God is someone who has only a fear of God. Of what he can do. And is alarmed at the prospect. And now will say sorry. Because they have a sense of this all-powerful God. And that there's no escape from him. I put to you that everyone, everyone without fail, no matter how macho they might be, no matter even if they said clever words like Winston Churchill, who said, I'm ready to meet my maker, but the question is, is he ready to meet me? What a ridiculous thing to say. Great man that he was. What a foolish thing to say. On the day of judgment, everyone will be terrified before God. Everyone. And everyone, that is, who has not truly repented. Even, I dare say, even those who have repented. Many of those who have truly repented may have a fear, indeed will have a fear, but not now of consuming fire. Not now of all consuming wrath. If Israel (coughs) trembled at the foot of the mountain, When the law was given, what will it be like to have to stand before the one who gave the law when he judges you by it? What will it be like then? They don't look, though, here at their judge. They look at the one they have pierced. They're not looking at their judge. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. And what is going through their mind is not this, now I'm sorry because there's no escape. What's going through their mind is, how could we do such a thing? How could we do this? They will look on me. The one they have pierced. The one they have pierced. How can we do such a thing? And that I put to you. Is true sorrow. How could I do this? They will not look at their loss. They will look on me. They will not look at their judge. They will look on the one they have pierced. And they will not look at the punishment. You go right back to Genesis chapter 4. What do you find there? You find Cain. He murders his brother. And the Lord comes and banishes Cain. He's sent out. He's sent east away. Away, away, away. What does he say? My punishment is more than I can bear. His focus is all on his punishment. Oh, woe is me. Poor me. There's our criminal again. This time, he's not going to hide away his stuff. He's going to confess it all. He's apparently filled with regrets. And he's willing to assist 
the police with their investigations. But why is he doing it? He's doing it because of the fear of punishment. He's doing it because he hopes that he might get a reduced sentence. That's all he's doing it for. The uh, defendant would like 16,000 other crimes to be taken into consideration as well. Because he wants a reduced sentence. Many people have heard the gospel. Are you one who has heard the gospel? And they have repented simply because they want to escape hell. The sentence of eternal death. That's the reason they've repented. Let me ask you, search your heart. Search your heart. Is that you? Is your repentance merely to escape the consequences? They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they won't say, oh no, we're going to be punished now for doing that. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn. What have we done? What have we done? The Lamb of God, lifted up, crucified. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will cry, what have we done? And that, I put to you, is true sorrow. True sorrow. What have I done? What have I done? How could I sin against you? How could I do this? Where are they looking? They're not looking at their loss. They're not looking at the judge. They're not looking at punishment. But they're looking at him. The one they have pierced. How are they looking? Second point. How are they looking? Much shorter. How are they looking? Well, they're looking with deep grief, aren't they? Deep grief. There it is in that verse, verse 10. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a, for a firstborn son. When David had banished Absalom, and he was yearning to see Absalom again, but he couldn't bring himself to work out how he could do this, Joab tricked him. And Joab sent a, a wise woman, the NIV says, a wise woman to him. And the wise woman came and um, had tears and sackcloth and all the rest of it. And he said, what's wrong with you? And she said, oh, I'm a widow indeed. I'm truly a widow. And my two sons, the only sons that I have, they got into a fight with each other. And one struck the other and he died. And now all the rest of the family and everyone's saying, deliver up the one that remains. He must die for his crime. Oh, what shall I do? My husband's name will perish. I'll be left destitute. I'll be left all alone. Well, what does that do to David when she says that? Tugs on the old heartstrings, doesn't it? There's nothing like, as a bad news story, hearing of something tragic that's happened to a child to cause us all to feel like, and indeed literally to weep. And then when we see a parent who is aggrieved in that way, to weep with them. We feel it. We feel it deeply. In verse 11 we read, On that day the weeping in Jerusalem will be great, like the weeping of Hadad women in the plain of Megiddo. What's that all about? That's telling of a time. It's reminding of a time when Josiah was king. Josiah was a godly king. But foolishly he went to war against Pharaoh Necho. And Pharaoh Necho slew him. He died. He died at that place, Hadad women, in the plain of Megiddo. That's where he died. And the weeping was great, truly great, because he was the last godly king. There wasn't another one. That was the end of him. And so the weeping was great. Quenched any hope for Israel at that time. The last godly king, or I should say Judah. The last godly king. So when we read... They will mourn as 
One mourns for an only child and grieves bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. You know, I have to be careful how I say these things because can there be any deeper grief than to lose a child? An only child that you've you've born in your womb. You've delivered, you've raised, you've nurtured. At any time on that pathway, it's tragic. And that is the example given here. Because what the Lord is saying, they will look in that way on the one they have pierced. They will look on the one they have pierced with the deepest grief and sorrow imaginable. That's how they're looking. Deepest grief and sorrow imaginable. Imaginable. Thirdly, who is it? Who is it that gives them those fixed eyes of sorrow? Where does that come from? This is Judah we're talking about. This is a people that have rebelled against God. Well, indeed, the whole world has rebelled against God. But here in this verse, it's the people of Jerusalem that are being spoken of. People of David that are being spoken of. Who gives them the tears? Who gives them the sorrow? Who gives them those fixed eyes to look to the one they have pierced with sorrow? Look at the first part of the verse. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. You can do a a, a, um, a V, what is it? not a V, a, a verses. A this verse is this. You can get all the different translations of the Bible um, lined up and you can see which ones have a capital S and which ones have a lowercase s for spirit. But ultimately it doesn't matter whether you choose a lowercase or an uppercase because ultimately... It is the Holy Spirit that is being spoken of here. The Holy Spirit being poured out. A Spirit, the Spirit, of grace and supplication. And what does that tell us? The Holy Spirit comes upon them. The Spirit of grace and supplication is given to them. It's the Holy Spirit. It tells us that true repentance is God-given. True repentance comes from above, not below. True repentance doesn't come from the depths of my heart, my soul. It comes from above. And it penetrates the heart. It's God-given. And this is seen, this coming from above, this true repentance, is seen through their conviction. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn. It's seen through conviction and sorrow. They look on him and they mourn. They mourn. There's the sorrow. What's happening? What's happening in this verse? What's happening to these people? I'll tell you what's happening. What's happening to these people is they are having a clear sight. They are being given a clear sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are experiencing a realisation of who he is. Is Now that realisation will come to every single person on the day of judgment. And if I take the world as a whole, we can say that it will come to the vast or vast numbers of people. That realisation will come with deep sorrow and bitter mourning. It will be a worldly sorrow. It will be a worldly sorrow that will say, Oh, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. What's going to happen to me now? What's going to happen? I got it wrong. And now it's too late. What will happen to me? That's worldly sorrow, isn't it? Worldly sorrow. And it's deepest degree. What will happen to me? Godly sorrow, godly sorrow, says, what have I done? What have I done against him? 
What have I done against him? How could I do such a thing? Now I see who he is. How could I have done such a thing against him? It grieves and it says, I see him now. I see him now. Oh, to lose him. To lose him is to lose all. Is to lose everything. You see the difference? Yet this is God given. It's God given. Therefore, the glorious truth is if God gives that sorrow, if God gives those tears, if God gives that realization, does He stop there? Does He do such a thing? He's a merciful God, He's a God of love. And you go to chapter 13 and you read the first verse and you read, On that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. And the floodgates are opened and all may come in. I don't think that's in the verse, but I've just put it there anyway. The way is open. The way is open. It's God given. He doesn't give in part. And so the penitent, who's convicted by the Holy Spirit, who has a Holy Spirit sorrow for what he's done, comes before the Lord, lays it all before him. No artex. No artex. And says, as we read in 2 Corinthians 7, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. So therefore the penitent lays all before him without the artex and says, Oh Lord, oh Lord, take everything from me. All I want is you. And I have no regrets about giving up everything for you. Nothing will I hold back from you. Lord, search me. Know my heart. Know if there is any wicked way that I'm keeping from you. Reveal it, Lord, that I may repent of it. That I may run from it. That I may hate it. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day the weeping in Jerusalem will be great, like the weeping of Hadad women in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of Shimei and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. But you know, their tears... Though they be great, their mourning, though it be a bitter mourning, above all their tears, above their mourning, in those words, the one they have pierced, a father mourns for his only son, God the Father, God the Son. Father mourns. And if you can enter in, if you've indeed entered into any of that bitterness, any of that sorrow, bitterness by that I mean mourning, tears and sorrow, if you felt anything at any time of the pangs of, what have I done? What have I done to him? Think how much more Does the father grieve for his son whom he sent into the world so that our grieving now could turn into tears of joy? Our crying and screaming now could turn into a song of laughter and rejoicing above our mourning 
The father mourns for his only son. Well, why would he do that? Why would he do that? He does it because he loves you, doesn't he? He does it because he loves you. Ezekiel 33. We read in Ezekiel 33 in verse 11, he says this. Ezekiel is told about the people's offences and he's told that, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, Ezekiel 33, 11, As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? God loves the house of Israel. God loves the world. He sent his son, allowed his son to be pierced by wicked men. And indeed, though we were not there, pierced too by us. But he tells us all to turn, to turn from our wicked ways. What I want us to do is to check, look into our hearts and check our own repentance. If indeed we have repented, check your repentance. What sort of repentance was it? That verse in 2 Corinthians says how godly sorrow leads to repentance that leads to life ends by saying, but worldly sorrow leads to death. Leads to death. Why? Because worldly sorrow has me at the centre. I will be king. Was your repentance... If indeed you've repented, was your repentance solely to escape your judge? Did you have a realisation that there is a judge you must come before? And your repentance was solely to escape him. Were you only, only motivated by fear? Was self really at the centre? You know, it's possible... It's possible that there's someone here and your church going is really just part of your artex that is seeking to cover over the cracks of your life. There's another verse in Ezekiel 33 and it's right near the end of that chapter and it says this in verse 31. My people, they come to you, the prophet, they come to you as they usually do. And they sit before you, the preacher, to listen to your words. But they do not put them into practice. Oh, wonderful words, wonderful words, they say, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouths they express devotion. Hallelujah, they say. But their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them... You are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. For they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. It's possible your church going is simply part of the artex. The sobering lesson we all need to learn if we think in that way is the futility, the futility of trusting simply in religion. Religion is like Artex. There's Job, I mentioned earlier now, let's go to the end of Job's life. And there's Job and he's threatened with death, indeed he's going to be struck down. Ben and I has sent, been sent for his murderous crimes to strike him down. What does Job do? He runs and he grabs hold of the horns of the altar. Here I will die, he says thinking that somehow his religion will save him. Thinking that somehow being in a holy place will save him. The trimmings of religion. But religion, without true repentance and faith in Christ Jesus, is worthless. Worthless. The sight of looking on the one they have pierced looking on him not my sin 
but looking on him. They will look on me. The sight of him, not my sin, is what should bring me to tears. Yes, it is because of my sin that I brought to tears, of course. But I'm saying it's not because, oh dear, oh dear, I'm going to have to give up this. Or, oh dear, I'm going to now be punished because of this. It's the sight of him. (gasps) What have I done against him? And such a one who is given a godly sight, such a one who has a true sight, Holy Spirit given, such a one is ready to condemn themselves before the Lord. And to actually say to the Lord, have you ever said this? Lord, I deserve the darkest pit of hell. I deserve the hottest fire of hell for the things I've done against you. Have you ever sincerely said that? That's true penitence, isn't it? That's true sorrow, that's true repentance. Seeing, putting yourself in the dock, putting yourself there where the criminal was before in earlier illustrations, putting yourself there and saying, I don't need anyone to speak on my behalf. I speak for myself and I am guilty. Guilty. It was my sin that took him to the cross. Oh, how could I? How could I? That's true sorrow. True sorrow. And maybe terror did drive you to Christ initially. Maybe it was some of that. Maybe there was a, a fear of the consequences that started you on the path. But now if your repentance was true, now you too look. You look at the one you have pierced. And you're still looking. And you say, Christ is all to me now. And though you're overjoyed at the fact that he has taken your sin, you're also ever so sorry that he had to go there in order for it to be removed. Have you truly repented? Have you truly repented? Search your heart. Because we don't want anyone in this church to be considered to be a member of the church or a friend of the church a regular attendee of the church and yet come to the day of judgment and find that the rest have got to testify against you and see that one or that two or whoever it is being condemned our text is no good you need Christ you need Christ two more things very briefly back to Zechariah. When are they looking? That's the question. When are they looking? And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. When's that? I will pour out on the house of David. When is that? Verse, chapter 13. On that day a fountain will be open, open to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. When are they looking? It's clearly a future day, isn't it? Ah, you say, yes, well, where are they looking? They're looking on the one they have pierced. It's the day of the cross. It's that first Good Friday. It's the day when Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross and he died. That's the day they're looking at. Well, that might be the day they're looking at. But that isn't the day they're looking. That's not the day. If you go to John 19, you see, in John 19, at the end of the passage we've been through over the last few weeks, it tells us in verse 36, these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. That was fulfilled. That was fulfilled there and then, that day. But look how John writes the last part. He doesn't say, and another scripture is fulfilled. He says, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. They're not looking now, not in the way they are in Zechariah. He's just highlighting that here. It's something yet future from that time. On the day of the cross, those Jews that are gathered there, they're not mourning. They're actually looking with joy. They're saying, hey, great, now all we've got to do is get him down and then we can celebrate the real feast. The real religion. 
which of course was false. They're looking then with joy, not mourning. It's a future day. It's a future day. Because it says, they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn, not dance for joy. It's a future day. And then the last thing to say is this. Who is looking? Who is looking? Verse 12 says in Zechariah, The land will mourn, each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves. The clan of the house of David and their wives. The clan of the house of Nathan and their wives. The clan of the house of Levi and their wives. The clan of Shimei and their wives. And all the rest of the clans and their wives. It starts off by saying, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great. David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem are the ones who receive the spirit of grace and supplication. It's the Jews. That's what's being spoken of here. Surely here is a great promise, or rather a promise of a great multitude. It's not one and two here and there, is it? It's a great multitude. A great multitude being swept in. Final thing to say. Let's pray. Let's pray that that day would indeed be our day. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be hallelujah? Wouldn't we not care about a place like this then? We really wouldn't. Let's pray. Amen. Let's pray as well.